So I'm Kelly Nealon of Lasting Light Wellness, and we do lots of fantastic healing, and I'm here to talk to you today about Andean shamanism. Um, at Lasting Light Wellness, we do a lot of things. We do hypnosis, we do eight types of Reiki, we do shamanism, past life regressions, intuitive services, and aromatherapy. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about me, because I always say I had kind of an interesting path. I went from stockbroker to shaman, which is the logical <laughs> progression of, you know, how most, most people, you know, <laughs> take their lives. So um, there was, you know, a little why in the fork of the road there where I had my own health healing crisis. And that took me from kind of my traditional lifestyle and my corner office job when I went to the top doctors in the country and they were like, well, we don't really have anything for you. We'll call you in 10 years if we develop a new drug. And I was like, no, no, there's got to be something else. So that took me from my traditional route to just starting to research. And I became a yoga teacher and I learned how to do Reiki and I learned all these things. I was like, this is amazing. Like I was able to heal myself. And I was like, people have to know about this. So I quit my corner office job and I started doing this and everyone thought I was at that point having an early midlife crisis, so to speak. But um, I've been here for over 22 years and enjoyed every, every minute of it. So I love getting out and spreading the word. These are a couple of my favorite chamans that I studied with um, in Peru. So my Andean path led me to, I had some friends one day that invited me and said, hey, there's this shaman thing. I know you were studying Cherokee and your Cherokee master died. You know, maybe you'd be interested in this. So they introduced me to some Peruvians that were in town visiting and I loved the way they did shamanism. And I liked it so much I ended up going to Peru many times over the last decade and studying with them and learning with them. And what I really like is that the shamans that I studied with, they're running the school for themselves. It's not somebody that came in and is just making money off their backs, which is unfortunately what we see at a lot of the larger institutions and, and things like that. So I really like that they, they were doing this because it's a legacy for them, because right now, you know, their way of life is living practically like the 1600s high in the Andean mountains. And, you know, only one in eight of their children are choosing to stay when they now find out that there's an iPhone and running water and, you know, all of that sounds a lot more attractive than living on the mountain. So their whole way of life is very quickly dwindling down and down. I mean, I think when I first started, there was maybe eight to 10,000 people left living in the tribal way. And we're now down below 4,000, even in this decade amount of time, because the, you know, they're not staying and it's, they're starting to now build roads closer. It's still a three-day travel by either foot or horse from the last road, but it used to be five to seven days. So as you know, encroachment comes in and it's easier to leave too and things like that, a lot of people aren't staying. So they said that they're, they wanted to teach Westerners like myself and other people because there's an Andean prophecy about the eagle and the condor coming together and us being stronger. And they were told by prophecy around the time of the mid to late 80s when the polar ice caps started to melt that it was time for them to come down off the mountain, so to speak, a little bit and come and speak with Westerners and start spreading their knowledge because otherwise this was gonna die out. They just weren't having enough people stay that were of the path to be able to do this. So it was really important for them that people are communicating this and teaching it that, you know, the people they've taught, like myself, are, you know, coming and teaching it to larger amounts of people because they said this is the knowledge, this is the energy uh, that we're coming into in this whole new 2000 year cycle that we're in, that we need to reconnect with the earth, we need to reconnect with the divine feminine, we need this information to be out there for everyone. So it's kind of just been this divine, like, like a lot of things you find in this path, you know, you met somebody, you met somebody, and there I was in Peru. And, you know, so I go, I go there quite frequently, and it's just been a beautiful experience and a beautiful un unfolding of knowledge that's come my way. So I just am really passionate and love to, to share this with other, other people. So as you may know, shamanism 
has been around for a really long time. They're estimating it like, could be 100,000 years old. And this is based on graves that they've found with shamanic tools and implements in them. And it just really focuses on being connected to spirit. And shamanism is a spirituality, it's not a religion. You're free to practice whatever you want. And that's a big misconception that a lot of people have. It's, it's not a religion. And you know, at one time before we had the rise of many different types of religions and governments, there was shamanic practice in all parts of the world. I mean, you can find traces of it everywhere. So on every continent, there has been shamanic practices going on. But you know, because we had certain regimes or certain religions come in that kind of stamped a lot of things out, things went underground and different things like that. So one of the reasons I was particularly interested in learning from the Peruvians was that the, one, the tribe that I study with in particular was they left when the Spanish conquistadors came in over 500 years ago. So they were told on prophecy they had to go flee. So most of them went way, way, way high, you know, 14 to 16,000 feet into the Andes Mountains to hide from the Spanish conquistadors that were killing off all of, all of their class. Some people hid into the jungles and the other part hid high in the mountains. So I studied with the, the mountain shamans up there. They get high on life. The jungle shamans, you may have heard what they do. Um, so just slightly different, but we respect all paths, but they were originally one, one tribe. They just used what was around them. So for the shamans in the mountains, what I like about it is that since up until the late probably 80s or really early 90s, they really didn't have much outside influence at all. There was a social worker and, or a, um, not a social worker, but an anthropologist who came across somebody from the tribe in 1959 and wrote that we have these ancient peoples hidden somewhere. They happen to be wandering and the, their whole people like ran away from them thinking the Spanish had come for them 400 years later. But um, this, so there was a writing that somebody knew that there was these people living somewhere high in the Andes using the old types of weaving and different things like that, but they didn't know anything about them and they were scared of them and didn't want to talk to them and ran from them. So it really wasn't until much modern times here that they actually had any interaction. So their version of shamanism is very pure because they didn't, they weren't stamped out. They weren't, you know, it had been continued to be passed down generation after generation. So it's only in places in the world like this that they were very sequestered. Like you may find a little bit of this, maybe like the Siberian shamans too, where like they were very isolated because of their geography. So that's one of the reasons I really love this type of shamanism and it's really called to me. So the actual word shaman comes from the, the Tungus word in Siberia, which means one who can see in the dark. So it's referring to um, fun things that we, we get to see when we're in the, the other realms. And this is just a quote from Michael Harner. And what I liked about it was pointing out kind of the obvious. When you think about all these people throughout the last you know, 100,000 years or more that we have evidence that people were doing shamanism, these people were living at a hard time, especially back then. Like They didn't have extra time to take on and do ceremonies and do things if they didn't actually get results from it. They would have stopped doing it. Life was hard then. You're not going to spend all this extra time doing something if it's not yielding the results you want. So I always say shamanism is very practical work. You know, The proof is in the, in the results and what you get from it. And I like how he talks about that. So a lot of people are like, what does a shaman, when I tell people I'm a shaman, you know, I kind of get the, the, the little crooked, huh, you know, kind of look. So uh, the two main types of shamanism that I practice, one, I'm a community-based shaman. I'm a Pampa Messiah Ux. So I work a lot with unifying the community, working on energy of the community. I'm currently working on some 5D work. They're trying to get me to up-level people in mass and, and bring up things like that. And I do things to try to bring the underpinnings of the community together. The other type of shamanism I do is in the Andean stream is chumpic shamanism. So I know how to, if you've seen those little shaped chumpy stones around, a lot of times they'll sell them at places and people are like, what do you do with them? Yes, there's an entire shamanic practice around that. So I work in the chumpic area as well. But shamanism is very practical. So I work with people that are going through transitions in life. Sometimes that's a death, a divorce. It could be a new job, a new baby, whatever they have coming in. Because sometimes we need our energy adjusted as we're moving from one thing into another thing. 
So I work a lot with helping people through you know, various different phases of their life. Sometimes it's their energy body, they need their chakras balanced. Sometimes they have a block to abundance coming into them. And I just say, you know, look at what's going around. We need more shamans now than we ever did, like light workers of all kinds. Like we really need to bring this in even more. Some other things people come to me for is like when sometimes I have people, I'm like the, sometimes the last of the line, you know, <laughs> when they're like people in a more traditional route are like, okay, now I'm going to go see a shaman. <laughs> like I've, I've exhausted all the other, other categories. So sometimes people are just like, there is something wrong. I don't know what is wrong. I'm feeling disconnected. I'm feeling blocked. I don't know how to fix this. Like there's something going on. So sometimes people come to me for that kind of thing. Either my creativity is blocked. I have something going on or they come to me for like doing services and blessings for new things they have, new enterprises, whether it's a new business, a new family, a new relationship, things like that. So in shamanism, we believe everything is alive and has spirit. And I can tell you that I've been in shamanic states doing shamanic journeys where I've actually been able to see like the light cord that connects all of us. So I always say this illusion that like we're getting it over on somebody or that like there's a ripple that continues to go go through everything. Like we're all connected on an energetic, you know, level. We're not separate. So it's and it's an illusion that we're just I can do what I want and it has no effect on, <laughs> on, any, on anyone else. So as soon as we come to that conclusion more of a global scale, how fantastic fantastic will that be? Um, so one of the other practices I do, which I'm going to give you just a little sampling of today, is a shamanic journey. And when we do that, we do a trance experience. We'll do the best we can in this, this setting today, but it'll give you an experience with that. And I'll probably have more information up on YouTube and things like that if you want to try it at home in a quieter environment. But what we do in a shamanic journey is we use something to bring us into a trance state. We're going to use a drum beat for that. We're going to go the legal way here, you know, all drums, <laughs> rattles. I told you I studied with the mountain caro. The mountain caro get high on life. So we're doing it in the mountain caro tradition. Nothing against other ways, but we're, we, we like where we are here. So. Um, we can use sacred objects, like I have my drum here, I have rattles, things like that. So you can use those type of instruments, the correct drum beat to bring you into that trance-like state. And then where you have to know like specifically where you're going and what you're going to do. So I'm going to guide you through that process today. And in a journey, you can do many different things. We're just going to connect in with our, our guides today. So just I want to give you just a teeny bit of a nibbling of a background on Andean shamanism. So in Andean shamanism, we have seven different sources of power. So these are the type of things I teach you in the training class. One is represented by sun, which is fire, because we believe fire is transformative, kind of like the phoenix rising from the ashes. So what we do is we do a lot of fire ceremonies to release things. We might be sending offerings. We might be burning stuff off if we're doing a removal type of ceremony. So I always break in all my new neighbors around me when I get new ones and I'm in the backyard around the fire pit doing my drums, you know. So they're always like, oh, OK. I didn't know this when I bought the house. I'm like, hey, I'm a friendly shaman. But uh, so a lot of times we do, we'll do those kind of ceremonies. We do a lot of work with the earth. So we do a lot of grounding and earth offerings and things like that. We call the earth Pachamama, our earth mother. We also do ener believe things move and have the energy of the wind or the air, the, we call wari. So we have the wind take things away. We connect in with the water and we also connect in with water messengers. So certain animals are considered messengers of the water and bring us information and blessings. We use, we uh, have animals that we connect with. So some of you have probably already heard about somebody connecting with their spirit animal or their spirit guide. So we use those. But sometimes we don't get as much talk to the later too. So we also have, just like we have power animals, we also have power plants or spirit plants. So there may be a specific plant that can also help you in your medicine healing, as well as stones, which we call kuyas and Andean healing. So we also do a lot of work with crystals and stones as well. And in the Andean tradition, we create, and you do this in the shamanic training class, you create a sacred healing bundle. This is called a mesa. And in here are all the stones that I use to do my own healing 
that were then transformed through ceremony to be able to heal others. So we're always healing what we got going on first before we can heal someone else. So this is created doing the four directions and doing healing in all of those directions for ourselves, and then through ceremony, transforming those objects. So I have other sacred objects in this. As well, it's, it's wrapped in a traditional cloth of the Caro tribe. And in their claws, I love it because everything is woven down the middle. I don't have one undone at this second, but, and this represents the divine masculine and the divine feminine, which they see is equal in all of their harmony and all throughout nature, because they said that's how it is throughout all nature too. You need both sides of everything. So they're very much about developing those things in both, both genders and also, you know, seeing them as sacred and divine in both genders and that we have to work together and things like that. So I like how even in their weavings that they put that in and all of their traditional weavings as well. So I would say compared to maybe like I've also studied with the Cherokee and stuff, and sometimes they have like little medicine bundle paths. So the Proven's are a little bit more of a heavy packers. So we've got we've got a little bit more of a substantial bundle um, that we that we carry around with that. And I'm just going to talk a teeny bit about the shamanic view of illness, maybe as compared to what you're used to in the Western model. So there's three main things in the Andean forms of healing that we look at as far as how illness comes in. One is a loss of power. So this could be different for everybody. If you're a person maybe who is entire, you know, life is wrapped up in your job and that is your you know, ideal of who you are as a person and everything's tied up in that and you lose your job, you may be completely devastated. Where to somebody else, it's an inconvenience, they'll get another one, but it doesn't completely devastate them. So something like that, some big loss of power. So if somebody has something like that, typically I would either do a shamanic journey for them to figure out what needs to be brought back from the spirit world to make them whole and give them wholeness and healing, or we may need to do a different ceremony just to restore that type of power. There's many different types of shamanic ceremonies I do. So that's what we do in that case. The next one is gonna be a loss of soul essence. And this is gonna be a loss that could come in, it may be, could be like a death or a divorce, something that just, you know, an accident, something that really jars you. And for this to heal it, we would typically do a lot of times a soul reintegration ceremony, sometimes called a soul retrieval. I kind of like the word integration because it makes it sound like, oh, I went to Target, oops, lost a piece of my soul. <laughs> no, you've not like lost it. It's just kind of moved away from the other pieces. So it's just separated and it's not integrated. So things aren't moving and flowing between them. We're not having communication. Things feel off. You know, it's kind of like having one of your chakras really, really low. Like it just doesn't feel right. But you didn't lose it. So I prefer to call it a soul integration ceremony. So a lot of times that's traditionally what we would do for that type of loss. And then the last one would be if you actually have some type of negative energy attachment or spirit attachment or a serious blockage. And for that, we have different types of removal ceremonies that we do in order to remove that blockage or that attachment from you and send it on its way so you can heal that spot of you that allowed it to attach and move it on. So the other question I get a lot of times is, well, how is shamanism different from other types of like being a psychic or being a medium or things like that? And I'm both of those things as well. But the difference with shamanism is that, you know, as a medium, I can like tune in and I might be able to talk to spirit and things like that or people who have crossed over. But it's just like that communication where in shamanism, I can go into the spirit world and I can bring back things. So I can bring back healing tools. I can bring back things um, from the spirit world that will help in that person's healing and things like that. It's not just interacting with the spirit world. So that's kind of how the two or three different ones differ there. And in the Andean cosmology, there's three levels. It's not related to the Christian levels, but we have the upper world, which is the Hunan Pacha. And this is where we kind of have, this one's kind of similar, but we have all the higher, the angels, the higher spirits, that type of energy resides there, in there. The middle world, the Kai Pacha, is where we all are. This is the 
3D, present 3D earth world that we're all in here. And you know, there's spirits in this world, there's people, there's animals, we've got all this going on. And then the lower world is called the Ukapacha. And this is where shamans do a lot of their work. Like my shaman tree is gonna be down there, my power animals meet me down there, and I'm able to do a lot of transformative work there. So it's a very positive place. So like I said, very a lot of times people are like, oh, the lower world. I'm like, no, the lower world's great. I'm like, I'm in the lower world all the time. I'm working and doing like really great things and having fantastic experiences. So I just like to make that clear. It's completely different as far as that goes. Now, you may have heard the terms calling in sacred space. They do this in a lot of shamanic traditions. And this is simply where we're empowering the energy of the four directions, but it's really six because we do above and below. But <laughs> it's been called, de coined the four, so we go with the four. And we, as the Andean shamans, call in, and especially attached to a lot of the mountain energy as well. So mountains are called apus in Quechua. And the shamans I study with speak Quechua because they fled when the Spanish came in. So they're speaking the original Incan language. So that's why they don't speak Spanish. So they do all of, you know, it's, they, we just have everything translated. We have a translator that translates it into English, Spanish from the Quechua <laughs> when we're learning down there. So yeah, there's a lot of translation flying all over the, all over the place. So when we do this, what we, why we create sacred space is we want to always protect our energetic field before we open ourselves up to anything. So that's where a lot of people go wrong. <laughs> you know, they either see something on online and they're like, oh, I'll start doing some type of divination or some sort of calling in of something and you haven't protected your space. You need to protect and make your rules about what do you let in? Who is allowed to talk to me? So that is the first thing we do anytime um, that we're going to do any type of work. So I would say one of the reasons that I love shamanism is because shamanism is one of the few, at least in my experience, energetic practices that actively encourages you to step outside the box, to figure it out your own way. Like my shaman teachers always said, I'm going to show you one way how to do this, but I encourage you, if you are guided through your guides and your connection, to do it a slightly different way or this, go ahead and do that based upon what you have brought in. It's not just one way. It's not your way or the highway type of thing. And I really like that approach because I think a lot of times each of us have different guides and different you know, gifts that we bring to the table. And it's really nice to have someone to be like, yes, we want you to use your special gift and bring that into the ceremony in your special way. So I think that's probably one of my most favorite things rather than some other types of energy healing I studied where there was 57 steps and oh my gosh, if you did step four before you did step three, you messed the whole thing up and, right. and things like that. Exactly. Yeah, we've all been there. So um, I, really, I really like being able to connect and make things and make things my own and you know it just I always say if your instincts brought you here Pachamama is a great place to to go back to so I always say this type of training that I do for in the shamanics is for people that just want to be able to reconnect to their power and be able to get and do their own divination for themselves be able to get answers for themselves be able to create ceremony for themselves some people want to do it professionally which is fantastic too but a lot of my students just want to have it for their own personal knowledge so that they can explore they can get the answers they want that they can be more powerful in their lives and they can show up for that it's also like i said since we go through the different directions we do healing on ourselves so a lot of people come to this type of training wanting to do and explore their own healing as well as expand all of you know their various different gifts that they have so in our training you not only do your own healing create your own medicine bundle but then we, we start in level one and we also have more advanced levels for people who want to continue who want to learn many many different types of ceremony to do so I teach a lot of different types of ceremonies you can do for yourself or for others like I said our shaman training class in the fall will be in person as well as we will have a separate version that will be online or you can do the in-person um, class as a hybrid if you need to miss one class we will record it all 
for you, so that will be in there as well. Um, I do a, I've done it in a class form, I'm also gonna do it in a pre-recorded form too, where I help people go back and heal like seven generations back, because so many, so many of us, I mean, life has not been easy, you know? So when you look back about what your ancestors, ancestors, you know, what they went through, sometimes there's a lot of garbage that people had to go through. So we work on clearing that energy through, and also being, um, I teach you different ways that you can integrate even throughout an entire year where you can tap into that ancestral energy and what, well, what positive things can we pull out too? Like what strengths and things have we had from our ancestors that we can bring forth to feed us now? So we work on both getting rid of the garbage, you know, all the stuff that wasn't serving us that may have come through our ancestral lineage as well as the positive spiritual gifts that maybe we aren't, aren't tapping into. So we do that. What other questions do we have? Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. You guys have been a great audience. And stop by our booth. And um, our healing center is in the Wild Lake Shopping Center in Columbia, Maryland. So feel free to make an appointment, stop on by, grab a